Okay, hi folks. I hope this is working. Let's see what happens when I. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Hi folks, we're going to look at lesson seven, uh, the highlights of the lesson, and just some of the general ideas that I think are very important for us to consider and think about. I'm joined today by Harold. So let's begin. So the first thing I wanted to talk about with regards to Lesson 7 is just pedigrees and how to read them and the information that we get. The Roman numerals on the side that are highlighted in orange, that helps us determine the generation. One being the oldest generation, three being the youngest generation. And they can go anywhere from one Roman numeral all the way up until as many generations that we have. In this class we're probably not going to have more than three, four, maybe even five though. The Arabic numbers, one through uh, four, as you can see in the greatest number in generation two, they help to determine the birth order. So the one being the oldest, four being the youngest in generation two. And it just helps us uh, to determine a way to specifically address an individual. We can say in generation one, person two, generation three, person one, and that will help to draw attention to that specific person for us to discuss and to talk about. So the next concept I wanted to talk about is sex-linked inheritance. I know a lot of people were having some issues and they were asking it in office hours about how do we know if it's sex-linked, y-linked, x-linked, what have you. The main thing here I want you to, to consider is that x-linked, it's always, always, always going to be males and females and it can be either dominant or recessive, right? It can be either dominant or recessive. And then we can also have what's called carriers. So. That's kind of nice that that's the case because it allows for us to determine who's a carrier, who's affected, and who's unaffected quite easily. Whereas with Y-linked, there's far fewer of these types of disorders and they can only affect males. And there can be no carriers, there is no dominant or recessive, it simply is just a person affected with a Y-linked disorder. So let's take a look at an example with regards to X-linked or Y-linked or autosomal. So we're trying to look at the type of inheritance pattern displayed here. And as you can see, just undo those highlights, uh, it's only males affected here. Now, does that mean that it's Y-linked? Well, no, because if it was Y-linked, we would expect that this person, as well as this person, would be affected because they're direct descendants of someone who is affected, generation two, number three. So because not every male is affected, we can't say that it is in fact a Y-linked or a sex-linked disorder. And likewise with regards to the X-linked component, because it's not, uh, it's not something that we can see readily, we have to be able to determine whether it is uh, sex-linked or autosomal. And then there's one key piece of information that helps us to determine that, right here. In generation three, people one and two, there's no one that's affected there, okay? There's no one that's affected there, so it skips a generation. And that helps us to determine that it is indeed a recessive sex link disorder because it only affects one gender, males in this instance, and it's recessive because it shows up, it shows up later on, right? It shows up later on. At the end of the day, it skips that generation and that's how we can determine that is sex-linked and recessive. Which trait is dominant? In this example, we're looking at color blindness, so normal vision would be dominant. And how does individual IV1 have color blindness even though neither parent has it? Well, we know that that trait was hidden because we determined that it was recessive. So parent or generation three, parent two, or person two, they carried the gene that was passed on from their parents and their grandparents, but they were a carrier, right? It's a recessive trait. As long as they only have one of those genes or they're heterozygous for it, they won't necessarily have that uh, trait. But because they are a carrier and they pass it on to their son in generation four, we know that mother or generation three, person two, is a carrier. So that's just one example we can look at how we can determine if it's sex-linked or autosomal and whether it's recessive or dominant. So another example I want to look at with you is this hitchhiker's thumb question, example two. I wanted to look over this question with you because I think it's important that we understand that we can differentiate between the type of patterns of inheritance based on who's affected and who's not affected. So when we look at this diagram and we look at this pedigree, 
we have a lot of individuals who are affected. And it's a pretty even split, male and female. I think there's one more male or two more male. But at the end of the day, we know that it affects both genders quite evenly for the most part. So we can say that it is, in fact, autosomal. And we know that it's autosomal recessive because it's a pretty even split of who is infected and who are impacted and not impacted. So we know it's autosomal and it's fairly evenly distributed, so therefore we know it is recessive. We let capital B represent normal or straight thumb, straight thumb, little b represents hitchhiker's thumb, and now we're going to look for all of the genotypes for each of the individuals. And I've already kind of done that for you, but I want you to really pay special attention to where we start with. We always, always, always start with our affected individuals because we know in this case, if it's an autosomal recessive trait, we know that every single individual is going to have homozygous recessive genotype for this trait. We also know that the partners here of this person in generation one must be heterozygous because its offspring have the trait of hitchhiker's thumb and if each parent gives one allele to their offspring, then the father must be heterozygous. And following that same logic, we can continue along the generations and label each of the genotypes for each of the offspring until we get to the part that I have highlighted in blue, where we see that this parent here must be heterozygous, and ultimately we don't know what that person's genotype is because they're outside of the family and they're not affected with the trait. So they could be homozygous dominant, they could be heterozygous, but there's a key giveaway here with this offspring. Again, because they're impacted and they have that hitchhiker's thumb trait, they must be homozygous recessive. And if they are homozygous recessive, that means one of the parents has to give, or one of each of the parents has to give that recessive allele Therefore, that father must also be heterozygous. So both parents are heterozygous, and we here see a pretty good distribution. One in four of that offspring are uh, affected or it have the trait of hitchhiker's thumb, but I've also left these blank for the most part, other than we know they have one dominant allele. We don't know what that second allele is. It could be another dominant allele. It could be a recessive allele. We don't know because we don't have enough information. So we leave that second allele blank. We just have to say that we know they for sure definitively have one dominant allele. And I believe I say that in this note here. Yeah, trait not present in the parent's offspring. Yep, yeah. comes up later. So therefore we know it's recessive and that just brings us back to part A of the question. Okay, lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about test crosses because I think it's an, an important question that we discuss. Oops. Test crosses are used to determine whether an individual that displays the dominant phenotype is heterozygous or homozygous dominant. In order to determine this, we cross the parents or the, of, with the unknown genotype with an individual that is homozygous recessive. We know for sure this person's genotype, homozygous recessive. We then cross it with the parent and we look at the offspring. Based on the offspring, we can help to, it'll help us to determine the genotype of that unknown parent. Okay, that's it for my review of Lesson 7. Thanks so much for watching, and if you have questions, you know where to find me.